Greetings, everyone. My name is Rashmina William, and as co-chair of the AAAS STPF Water Affinity Group, I am delighted to welcome you all to Drought and Flood an Artistic Contemplation. On a personal note, this concert is a dream come true, combining my twin loves for the performing arts and hydrology. Art gets to the heart of what makes water such a special topic for me. It reaches into the emotions of how water ties us to place, how it unites us, how it can make or break our communities. And this concert is a reflection of the ebbs and flows of water in the natural world and how those flows shape our perceptions of our environment. I'd like to take a moment to thank our amazing planning team without whom none of this would be possible. Bill, Leslie, Aaron, Vengu, Kerry, and Brad have all put in so much behind the scenes work to bring this concert to life. Thank you as well to our excellent professional development staff at AAAS, Alexa Pinto and Jill Parsons. We are honored to showcase talented musicians, dancers and artists from around the world as well as our own AAAS STPF fellows. And we hope that in sharing their stories and talent, you come away with a little bit more appreciation for the ways that water binds our experiences together. With that, thank you for listening and enjoy the performance. The climate is changing. As shown in this time series from NASA, the average temperature of the Earth has increased significantly between 1880 and 2021, with the past eight years being the hottest since modern record keeping began over 140 years ago. As a consequence of changing temperatures, precipitation patterns around the globe are fluctuating, bringing increased drought to some communities while leading to massive floods in others. In this concert, we explore how climate change affects people and their communities, how it impacts their lived experiences, and how music, dance, and storytelling can increase our understanding of extreme weather events like drought and flood, empathize with those whose ways of life are threatened, and establish a narrative for how we can confront and adapt to climate change together. This is Drought and Flood, an artistic contemplation of our changing climate. My name is Kirsten Neff. I am the Southwest Rivers Program Manager at the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And what that means is that I run grant-making programs for the foundation that focuses on rivers in the Southwest and generally the Southwest landscape. I also run programs in the Pecos Watershed in Southeast New Mexico and West Texas and the Southwest Rivers Headwaters Program where we're focusing on restoring headwaters, wetlands, and streams throughout the West, throughout the Rio Grande and Colorado River basins with the idea that if we we can restore these wet meadows up in the headwaters, we can naturally store water longer at high elevations so that we have a steady stream of water coming out of our mountain water towers over the summer rather than it all rushing out in a spring pulse down to Powell or Mead where it largely evaporates or gets used. A lot of the species we focus on are listed threatened and endangered species, and we're trying to take the best science and determine with the money that we have, how can we invest this to have the biggest bank for our buck in terms of habitat and species improvement. We are in the most critical spot we've ever been in with the Colorado River. We're getting to the point where Glen Canyon Dam is not going to be able to generate power. The water is so low and that has recreation impacts as well. My friends and I here in Colorado love taking the boat out to Lake Powell. Most of the boat ramps are hundreds of feet above the water at this point. There's a groundswell of looking at more process-based natural approaches to restoration and storing water, restoring our hydrology, particularly in these montane headwaters ecosystems so that the watershed can function in a more resilient way. This is going to be an issue throughout my career because there's no one silver bullet answer. Our first piece is by Climate Focus North America, which has offices throughout the world. This piece created in collaboration with one of their partners, Sinfonia Tropical, was filmed during the Festival of Peace and Biodiversity in Colombia. The song is a cheerful narration of the gloomy prospect of rain not materializing, while the visual is of students engaging in a variety of workshops focused on climate change. We hope you enjoy.
camino para los kioscos íbamos un grupo de talleristas de sinfonía trópico cámara en mano y con muchas ganas de aprender plantas y frutos de muestras íbamos a recoger y pensábamos que iba a llover pero no llovió y pensábamos que iba a llover pero no llovió y pensábamos que iba a llover pero no llovió y pensábamos que iba a llover especies de animales y fruta y no tan silvestres que el ingeniero ruda nos mostró hombre inteligente y sabedor y pensábamos que iba a llover pero no llovió y pensábamos que iba a llover pero no llovió y pensábamos que iba a llover pero no Maraya va a volta que como sin que rida en paso. Maraya es olmo o lo sin que rida en paso. Y que ya no hay que ver. Como le ha un paso, te que perro el cariso y te pide que el barro y. Nere me sin que rida tor. Caparro ador papá y el mito jinde sapo que tor. Ne ya ta jinde a tu en paso. Na nyengua a ka año. Na putuku ni a yo que ya papá y. Kora ya bolo nanga zingir ragu kini tambaso. Ya tambaso kini. No odo rungolo. Katinungo ajo keti serango na chatai tepi yoru. Ratia karang rukumi mokuria pa yotum kuji tehengi shwenje. Ne belegenya arambaso. Ya ta zingiru puni ne olarraba. Ya tan a su tal don Anarán, a ese el guita en la tata. Esta rueda en hoy en hay que seguir. Más hay que seguir. Más hay que no está acá a Samach. Mora el guita en ello, que ya está soy tu toco. Tení ya está el guita, no hay que entrar nada más ahí. Cuál está acá, he hecho un barri y lo dan gare, he hecho un seguir. Y que te maga tu singer gutua, guayri. Y que todo el lacer, ni que yo lo singer ligutum. Para el lacer atian, y que todo el lapa lele, nacho yo singer rock. Para el togo coy, y que todo el lapa leonguan, neo gintini. Tiene que tu singer rucunini, ni que nanga en paso matoburu. Anna Aldoani Kito kata ngeno na itibire tor. Kata nchaman na ishuri ya ngeno lelero. 
Anna Singiri, or a Bagulmoro Kekuni. Where are we again? Nejon Galifuna Bekara. Again to ride the Bango Toga. Amuka Elduana and Catajina at twelve with the Marita. A mother Nigan to ride the Retirang Ajigiti. PhD, I worked on a really interdisciplinary project focused in Ethiopia, and we were working with rural agricultural communities in the northwest part of the country. And most of those are farmers who are rural subsistence farmers, and so they rely pretty much exclusively on rainfall, sometimes some irrigation to grow their crops. And so as our climate has been changing, the climate up there has gotten more variable just in terms of the amount of rainfall that they're getting and the timing of that rainfall. And so our project was to work with the communities to try and help develop ways of predicting if we think that it's going to be a really wet year or a really dry year. And part of this is because they have many traditional ways of telling when their main rainy season in the summer is going to start, but those are becoming less predictable as the climate changes. So we were wondering if a scientific forecast might be useful. And so we took several trips over there and really tried to engage with them on what information would be most useful useful to them. And we were able to develop a prediction that was pretty accurate for the whole season. So saying if the summer is going to be wet or dry, you're hoping is helpful to them because if you think it's going to be a drought year, you might choose to plant drought resistant crops. You might prepare less land or just generally make different agricultural decisions because they're, you know, really impacted by the weather and, you know, not enough rain means they don't have enough water to grow their crops and too much rain at the wrong time can wash the seeds off before they're allowed to start to grow. And so that's equally challenging. Another part of the project was really trying to communicate this because we realized the information is only valuable if we can work with the community to, to share that information. And so we tried to develop a communication approach with several sociologists on our team alongside the engineers. And so we ended up developing a really visual forecast bulletin to share this information in really visual and simple language. And, you know, went back and forth with our collaborators in Ethiopia and agricultural extension experts there to iterate and try and make that as useful and readable for those communities as we could. And then we paired that with public engagement sessions where we invited farmers from the community communities to join us and basically have a conversation and through that realized that using analogies that they were familiar with relating the chance of catching a taxi into the neighboring town to the chance of the rainy season starting helped them sort of understand the probability aspect which is something that is hard for all humans to to grasp. This next piece is by Company E in Washington DC. In their piece To Sail Around the Sun, a child sets off on a musical quest to return color and light to earth. They must travel the world gathering the light of all four seasons, blue for spring, green for summer, red for autumn, and white for winter. Rather than traveling through time, they travel through space, for all four seasons are happening somewhere on earth on any given day. Our story begins in the springtime of the reefs off the coast of Australia. Music dances, the world dances, this is Spring from Company E's To Sail Around the Sun.
So yeah, my name is Jeremy Elliott and I live in San Luis, Colorado. And I'm, I'm the executive director of the Costilla County Economic Development Council. I grew up in Boulder actually, and, um, or just outside of Boulder. And water was never that relevant to me as a kid growing up. You know, was, you look up at Long's Peak and say, oh yeah, the, there's uh, not much snow up there right now, you know, whatever. As I did get older, it was, and more and more subdivisions were being put in, in the back of my head, I always wondered where, where's their water coming from? Um, as time went on, I moved down to the San Luis Valley and water became very um, relevant, um, whether it was through pumping out water to send up to the front range from our aquifers to learning about the acequias, um and that, that whole network of acequias and the community behind that. Um, I would, I used to have a good friend of mine, a former County commissioner, Joe Gallegos. He was, I would, I would ask him questions about the estate. I'm like, what's the deal with these ditches? And he's like, you know, they're more than just a ditch. It's, it's a whole network of life, you know, where there's, it's the oldest adjudicated water rights in the state are down here. And they're very proud of having those water rights. And, you know, it's, and that water is life for, for a lot of the people in the community, whether it's, you know, growing crops for themselves, growing crops to sell. Um, you know, you look, look you, now looking up on the mountains, the, the, the one right here in town is Culebra Peak. And if that's empty in March, you take notice, you know, <laughs> there's no, there's not going to be a runoff and there's not going to be an irrigation season. And then that means, you know, hay prices go up and, you know, from three bucks a bale to 15. And can people afford that? Can people afford to even grow hay to feed their own livestock? Seeing how important that is and, and getting people to realize that don't live here to understand that is, has been a battle for a long time. Down here, if you want to have a, a, a strong fight, it comes around water. We, we experienced it several years ago with a lot of quote unquote off gridders coming down uh, because of cheap land and then going down to the Rio Grande and literally pumping water out of it. So they into a tank, which is a huge no, -no. <laughs> especially, you know, never mind just it just not being the right thing to do. But when you start throwing state compacts and all that type of stuff, it's a, it, that water is extremely regulated. You know, so it's, and that's when the community will rally and, and fight for the water and to protect it. It's one of those things where, you know, it's a cliche saying water's life, but it is down here. The valley has a weird way of sucking people in. <laughs> and yeah, it's been one of those things where it was never part of the plan, but here I am. And I talked to friends that still live up there and they're like, what are you doing living in the middle of nowhere? And it's like, yeah, it's slower pace of life and all that stuff. But and there's trade-offs, you know, there's no, I, not a lot of conveniences, but <laughs> give that up for quality of life at times. You, you don't see a lot of, you know, crop dusting and pesticides and all that type of stuff. They, the, the, the farming that happens here is the same farming that happened in the 1800s. It's just instead of using, you know, um, mules, to pull a uh, plow, they use tractors. But you know, besides that, you're still doing the the whole acequia system. But when you when you're out in the fields and you see this whole network of how they move water, and and then you know eating some of the the, the produce that's produced in these fields is just amazing. So yeah, it's like people that like the whole going to Whole Foods and buying all the organic stuff. It's like yeah, we have that right here, and that's why we protect our water. Our next piece is by Benny Starr, a hip-hop artist and the inaugural artist-in-residence of the U.S. Water Alliance. He is a native of South Carolina, and his work echoes the experiences of those living in flood-prone areas in the southeastern United States. We're pleased to present pieces from his work, A Water Album, 
which was recorded live at the Charleston Music Hall. You know, if we're being honest, I have a need to feel and to create and then to be felt. Growing up where I grew up in Pineville, in the low country of South Carolina, water had such a profound impact on our traditions and the culture, well, you know, what we ate, how we lived. Water is, is, is the life force, is rebirth and renewal. You know, it's real spiritual. And water also takes the form that it needs to take in order to do what it's purpose to do. And as I'm here in Charleston, in a city that's literally underwater, a city that in many ways has been the gateway to the black experience in America, with so many of its people still under the thumb of oppression, there is no more perfect metaphor. For me, it's not an absence of fear. It's embracing the fear, using it to go forward. It's not an absence of love, pain, strength, or vulnerability, but it's embracing all of it, owning all of it, and using it to push forward. It's the spirit of creativity, collaboration, and community. It's restlessness and rage, poetry, jazz. It's healing. It's beautiful. It's black. And it's political. Like me. Like my people. And that's a water album. So I want to introduce her. Her name uh, is Shaniqua McCants, and we're going to give you all this next record with the amazing 420s. It's called Nostalgia. Can y'all dig that? All right, that's what we're going to do. From my folks in the audible As the presence of my pop space faded My mom's vocal became jaded A warm alto told a story like Alpo Worrisome tunes, young beautiful virgin and black adults Thank God umbilical cause mass distortion A brass blown out of proportion When mama felt joy that relaxed me I would dance delicate dances when she'd ask me Everything she tasted, I tasted Joyful times were times ten Confined to her fetal like feeling of a time lapse Everyday reminded Fine night confinements are winding to its climax I never thirst till the water burst Now birth to this earth unrehearsed I traversed in a verse and my first words They were, I've seen it before, smelt it before Breathed it before, felt it before This all feels like nostalgia Yeah, yeah, it feels like nostalgia Yeah, yeah, it feels like I've seen it before I smelt it before, I breathed it before And I felt it before, this all feels like nostalgia Yeah, 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 it feels like nostalgia Come on, yeah, all right Like 
Feels like nostalgia. I feel like nostalgia. Yeah. Oh yeah, so it feels like nostalgia. Yeah, that's what it feel like. Listen, what becomes of a raisin in the sunlight upon sight? Tell me, are you startled at its ripeness? The same fruits on a shaded path are the grapes of wrath. You should marvel at its likeness, a dream deferred and reenacted. Still, my hands buried in the blur of my blackness feel the way I merge my recital with tribal dances on these rhythms to lure rain from heaven on these fingers. Face with me chasing the prophet on being a man of God. Spiritual war, digital songs, clanging analog, equal parts, paranoia, focus, and euphoria. A student, lover, poet, a warrior, me. Everything I see feels so routine like white terror. Pepper in the best of our cuisines to the chef. God bless you and God rest you. As I sit Wine and dine on this house special It feels like I've seen it before Smelt it before Breathed it before Felt it before This all feels like nostalgia I said it, I said it feels like nostalgia yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels like I've seen it before I smelt it before And I breathed it before I felt it before This all feels like nostalgia yeah, It feels like nostalgia What it feel like? It feels like I've seen it before I smelt it before I breathed it before I felt it before It feels like nostalgia it feels like nostalgia. Shit, it feels like I've seen it before, smelt it before, breathed it before, felt it before. It feels like nostalgia. I said it feels like nostalgia. Yeah, all right. I said it feels like nostalgia. I said it feels like nostalgia. I said it feels like nostalgia. Felt it before, feels like nostalgia. Feels like nostalgia. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Michael Kototawa Johnson. Uh, I'm a Hopi traditional farmer. I've been doing this since I've been a little kid. And um, it's kind of like uh, been pretty much my passion throughout my life. You know, I, I recently received my PhD in natural resource management. And so if you look at all these things, there's really kind of similarities between our bodies and, and the plants that we actually raise, especially at Hopi. One of the biggest ones we raise out here is corn. All of our corn, you know, if you look at it, realistically all of all of the Hopi names um, like the parts of our body have the same name of the parts as they do in the corn like the stalks is the is the is the spine and the and the arms are the leaves and so they have the same name so that's how come we have this special relationship with what we grow and so but but the most important thing that we do have is, is water you know uh, people come out to my climate in which I live in the place called Northern Arizona, up on the Little Colorado Plateau, we only re receive six to 10 inches of annual rainfall a year. And that's not that much. And so all of our techniques are designed to conserve soil moisture. And of course, moisture comes from water. It comes from precipitation in all forms. Not only does it come in rainfall, the most important is how much snow we get per year because that sits on the ground and it soaks down through the different layers of soil and uh, the, the seeds and the crops are able to thrive on that. And so that's that's why water is so important to us. But it's really, it's really, really more important to that. You know, it it, it has a spiritual aspect of it. You know, I mean, it, it's 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 almost like um, it's who we are. You know, it's who we are. And so, you know, a lot of people, you know, they ask me when they come out to this semi-arid environment where they see a bunch of shrubs and bushes and even cactus. Sometimes they say, well, you know, you guys would have a better better more. You'd raise a crop every year. You wouldn't have to worry about droughts if you would irrigate. You know, they, they tell us that. They, they told us, been telling us that for a long time. You know, but then I have a simple answer to that. I look at them and I say, well, then what would we pray for? You know, and if you really think about that, what would we pray for? Where, what are we doing if, we, if we're praying for rain that brings water to our soil to nurture our plants like little children? What are we actually doing? Where is our faith at? You know, our faith is also tied directly to our water. 
And so everything we do out here is, is based on faith. You know, that's what makes Hopi agriculture so resilient is that it's faith-based. You know? And so it's very important for us to continue that practice. And so and that part of that practice is not by going out and just bringing in man-made lines to irrigate our crops. You know, I mean, we do, we do have water. We do carry water to the field, but that's usually only for some of our beans and, and watermelon and squash plants that really need that in the month of July. Because you have to understand that we don't have any precipitation all the way from April to monsoon season, which usually starts around the last week of July. And so our seeds would not know what to do with it if we did have too much water. I think they might drown. <laughs> so, you know, for us, our seeds are what I call super seeds, hardy seeds. They make a lot of they make a lot of headway. And so they're proud to stand up, just like we are. We're proud to be, I would say, consider ourselves the world's best dry farmers in, in the world. And we still continue our practices. And that's something that I'm constantly telling the little kids out here, like when I had a posted about 32 Head Start kids from ages like two to four or something like that. They were they came out here and at the end of the day I gave them an all a big ear of corn and you know they were so happy with that holding it up and just showing that. And, Okay, I look at myself as like a vessel, like a clay pot. You know, I'm just, I'm just created, I'm created, and I have an open top, and so I'm able to catch things. You know, I'm able to catch things. At the same time, I'm just sitting there, being still enough that I can let those things come into me. You know, and uh, rather than just putting the lid on top and letting everything flow around me, I need to, I need to catch some of that good stuff out there. And so it's just kind of like raindrops. You know, you gotta sometimes in the in the season when the first rain starts to first coming down i'll just go out there and open my mouth and just you know let the water rain drops hit my hit my tongue and things like that because you know it, it's 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 just it's just humbling yourself you know i think that's probably the most important thing too is that you know we need to think about humbling ourselves because a lot of times when we become humble we also become quiet when we become grateful and we get, we get all those beautiful characteristics that makes us human beings I grew up on a farm out in the Little Valley in Penn Valley. The California gold rush happened here. We have a canal that was for moving around water for mining on our property. How has drought impacted us as farmers starts with when my parents decided to buy this place. They knew that there was rain and snow in the Sierras. This is where the water comes from in California. I think it's two thirds of the water comes from the Sierra Nevadas in our snowpack. Building the farm here was an act in preparation for what we're seeing now, which is historic droughts all across the state of California. This impacts us in many ways, depending upon where you're a farmer in California, it impacts you differently. This can be a huge economic burden for people as the price of water goes up because maintaining the water systems is expensive. Drought impacts farmers extremely economically. In our case, because we have really good old water rights, which is a huge political situation in California, that first in time, first in right water rights. This means that we have our water pretty well protected. We're not going to be economically damaged as badly as other people because we have an original old pre-1914 water right. For our farm, that part doesn't hit us as much. Our friends are talking about their $30,000, $50,000 water bills to grow their mandarins in the valley. For us, one of the biggest ones is you get to the summertime and it's fire season and you're working out in the fields and it's 95 degrees and and it's just inundated in smoke. If you put on a mask, you're going to have real trouble breathing. That gets extremely sweaty, very uncomfortable, and eventually just stops working because it's so wet and falls apart. It gets caught on things. It can be dangerous for operating heavy machinery. So you're spending all day in the baking sun with your air quality extremely unhealthy. So this is a huge impact of drought because of the fires that it brings in California and increasingly across the Northwest. Next, we have for you a piece by Samantha Marshall who's not only an accomplished dancer and choreographer, but also a mechanical engineer and a AAAS fellow at the U.S. Department of State. In this piece, her choreography explores both the weight and fluidity of water. The music for this piece comes from Aprimois la Deluge by Luna Pearl Wolf, which was written in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Enjoy. <laughs> Oh. 
On a summer visit to my hometown of Bogota, I convinced my tia Esperanza to take us on a road trip to Suesca, a small town about an hour's drive away. I'm connected to this place through my great-grandmother, Adelina Suesca. We visit the valley between the boulders that the town is named after, a favorite spot for rock climbers. We stroll through the plaza, stopping to pose for a photo in front of the fountain. I asked my tia if we can visit Laguna de Suesca, a rain-fed mountain lake on the outskirts of town. Such lakes are sacred to the Muisca people. Many are protected areas within Colombia's national park system, but Laguna de Suesca is not. We drive down a winding road leading away from town in search of the lake. It looks more like a big puddle, my tia remarks, upon seeing its diminished size, ravaged by years of drought. What is left of the lake is surrounded by cattle ranches, mining operations, and flower farms that consume water in this area at a faster rate than the rain can replenish it. Most of Colombia's fresh cut flowers are grown in the Sabana de Bogota region, making the country the second largest flower exporter in the world. Bouquets from stores or street vendors in the San Francisco Bay Area, where I now live, usually say made in Colombia somewhere on the cellophane wrapping. I know these vendors, like the young women who work for low wages and long hours in Colombia's flower farms, are just making a living. But at what cost? The amount of water used daily to grow flowers in this region is equivalent to what nearly 600,000 of its residents consume in a day. While flower farms soak up dwindling water supplies, Neighborhoods where their workers live face chronic water shutoffs. Pesticides and fertilizers put workers at risk of reproductive illness and cancer. Their residues also affect the health of plants, fish, and migratory birds. 
Workers toil for up to 20 hours a day for piecemeal wages during peak harvest times leading up to Valentine's Day and Mother's Day in the U.S. A website for a flower company with a farm in Sueska advertises that they obtain 80% of their water from rainfall, one of the strategies being promoted for greening this industry. I can't help but wonder if the rain capture to grow these flowers would have otherwise flowed into Laguna de Suesca. We look for holes in the barbed wire fences so we can approach the lake shore. My shoes sink into the soft mud of exposed lake bed that extends far around it. As my ancestors did, I leave a small offering to think what remains of the water, not knowing if it will still exist the next time I return. I did my PhD in particle physics, so data systems that are very complex from many different detector systems and bringing together that information to create a comprehensive model. That's what particle physics is. And in California, that's the name of the game with data. We've been collecting information in various different forms from sticks being put into creeks and measuring the height of it and estimating how fast it was flowing up to modern technologies we have that measure with a laser shining on the water. You have rate of flow measurement. All of this information when put into a model can be extremely useful for responding as a public to droughts that are ongoing and to future planning. This is extremely important for farmers who are trying to see, am I going to have water in the future, both on a short-term and long-term basis? So these planning exercises need to be started as soon as possible. There have been huge waterworks projects in California that have revolutionized our ability to farm and live. We aren't monitoring all of that information as well as we could be. We need to do it in a way that preserves people's privacy, in a way that honors their traditions and their background. The Native American people People of California have a huge important place at the table when it comes to water rights because they are their water rights. These are really big issues, but when you give a right, making sure that you fulfill on that requires a scientifically based method to make sure that you can actually act on the contract that was signed. There's big questions that have to do with hard numbers, combining those together in some integrated, interoperable system across the various different agencies. This is public health. This is going to get into forests. This is agriculture, city planning. All of those decision makers are trying to figure out how do I not make decisions like pumping a bunch of water into the wrong place? How do I reduce the toxins that are being created by the agricultural runoff? If we don't measure where the water's going, how much we have of it, we can't help any of those leaders prepare for the decisions they must make. This next piece is by Emma G. She currently lives in Washington, D.C. and is originally from New Zealand. Her song, Unity in Devastation, was commissioned specifically for this concert and seeks to leverage the tools of hope and unity amongst the complexities of drought. We hope you enjoy. It's been running round my head Flooding all my memories I was told to give, forget But it's hard to escape reality I said I was too young to care It'll wait until tomorrow but tomorrow's been and gone I'm trying to find strength in sorrow
systems are affected by drought in a lot of different ways and it really depends on where they get their source water from. Drought can impact obviously the availability of water but also the quality and with a co-occurrence of drought and heat events you sometimes get harmful algal blooms, other types of unwanted vegetative growth that makes it challenging for water systems to treat the water that they have to deliver. And the other challenge is that very small systems often don't have existing infrastructure to move water from large systems. And so when you end up with a small system that only have one or two wells, or they only have one service water intake, it makes it really challenging to adapt to drought because they don't have the same level of fire redundancy that a lot of larger systems will have. Our study was trying to learn directly from small system managers. When we think about California water, we think about Metropolitan Water District down in LA or San Francisco, like these bigger urban systems that have the capacity to deal with some of the climate changes or even just on going reoccurring droughts in the state. And so what we really wanted to do was elevate the perspectives of smaller system managers that don't always have the ability to communicate what their concerns or their needs are to state policymakers up in Sacramento. And so what we did, in addition to interviewing these system managers throughout the state, we also convened three regional workshops, one on the Central Coast, one in the Central Valley, one by this community in Clear Lake. And the goal was to have system managers in the room to confirm the research findings, to share their perspectives, and then a co-benefit of these convenings was just small system managers interacting with each other and sharing experiences and insight and sharing strategies and how they've been adapting to the drought. Because the challenge as a small system, you're often potentially in remote areas. You don't have as much interaction with other water system managers. So even though the focus of these conversations are really around the drought, I think a lot of other lessons learned were shared around how do you deal with fire? How do you deal with flood events? How do you think through changes to rates? things like that that can help a system be better prepared in the future were things that these meetings allowed system managers to exchange experiences over. And then we also organized what we call the policy forum in Sacramento, which is where the state capital is. And we further brought these small system managers in conversation with environmental justice advocates in conversation with state agency employees. So you actually had multiple perspectives in the room talking about this shared challenge of how do small systems 
adapt given the intensity and frequency of the drought then. And knowing that California is the type of place where droughts are reoccurring and climate change threatens to exacerbate and worsen the drought experiences that system managers are already trying to adapt to. What's really important is continuing to listen to and gather local drinking water managers' collective expertise. I think that is the only way that the state can understand where existing policy efforts are accomplishing what they set out or where there are gaps where they need to have more innovative policies. And I think continuing to listen is the way that we have a more climate resilient water system. Floods happen sometimes where I live. I usually like water, but I don't like deep water. Deep water has hidden things in it that aren't always good. Dogs are okay with it. They don't seem to fear deep water. When it floods, it can get really deep. Washing away bridges, cars, and houses. You can feel grateful when your stuff isn't destroyed. And guilty too. If you're creative and strong, you can help others through it. Time.